What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you a Block Digest special edition with Francis uh, Pouye. Uh, sorry if I butchered your last name. Uh, so I guess, what's going on, Francis, before everyone else says hi today? I'm doing well. I uh, just came back from uh, the Honey Badger Conference in Riga, which was uh, really insane. Uh, I'm sure everybody there that went there knows what I'm talking about. It was like four days of nonstop party and nonstop you know, discussions that went out really, really late. So uh, yeah, just resting from that craziness and getting back to work uh, tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's usually the fucking most fun part about events like that. It's not anything to do with the presentations. It's all the little side conversations you only get if you go there. Yeah, totally. I only watched, like, two or three presentations, um, but I'm going to catch up on YouTube eventually. Yeah, there's, it's not, not, not a conference without Shinobi constantly trying to pressure you to drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's let's say I, I am a very party oriented person, and Janine is a very not party oriented person. And I like to try and strike a balance on that. I, I think I'll say I'm, I'm more I'm more on the party side, uh, which is why I, every time I finish a Bitcoin conference, I'm like, yo, this is my last Bitcoin conference. I can't handle this anymore. But uh, I keep telling people like Bitcoin conferences are the best parties in the world. And I, I say that 100% seriously because like most parties I find incredibly boring, but it seems like taking shots with other Bitcoiners and like, you know, shit talking in real life instead of shit posting on Twitter is it's definitely entertaining. So highly recommended. Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, you know, uh, no para if he, uh, he'll show up if uh, he's got the time, but if not, uh, like that'll suck. But you know, we, we pulled you in here today uh, to talk a little more in depth about this interesting thing that uh, you know you're doing with Liquid, and you know I, I just guess uh, a good place to start would be you just giving a simple like TLDR of it because I think like this is really a brilliant like uh, you know unique way to use Liquid that I think is going to kind of open the floodgates of like get your brain outside the box when you look at it yeah sure um i guess well you know kind of the background on on me and liquid is i was actually pretty early in looking at the sidechains um uh white paper uh it was published the sidechains paper was published somewhere around like october november 2014 and um just so happens that um the blockstream team uh, used to spend quite a bit of time in Montreal. They, they had an office there and they used to do some meetings there. So the Blockstream team came by to the Bitcoin embassy a little bit after the white paper was published, maybe a few weeks after. And they spent like, you know, a good like two, three hours um, explaining to us uh, what sidechains were, answering kind of all our questions, um, which as a side note was pretty neat and um, really got me interested in Blockstream as a company specifically because it's not often that you get like five, six, um, you know, CEO, CTO, uh, and, you know, uh, very high level software engineers, you know, spend the, a few hours just talking to a bunch of nobodies. And, you know, in those days, we were just a bunch of guys with, uh, with, you know, an office space. We weren't really special or anything like that. So that definitely um, uh, presented blockstream in a very positive light to me. Um, and uh, I've been following the sidechains development since since the beginning. I've been following DriveChain also. I, I'm a good friend of, uh, well, I'm a, a good companion of uh, Paul Stortz. We're a drinking companion when we see each other at Bitcoin conferences. I'm, I'm on very good terms with him and right, I've Francis, been following. I'm sorry, we're going to have to stop this interview right now. I'm booting you off the server. Oh, Paul Stortz is a <laughs> controversial topic here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! I, I, I am abs. I am. I'm, we, we, we can get into it maybe at a later point uh, in the interview. But I am absolutely not a fan of drive chains or any proof of work involved side chain. Oh, I, I, I don't have any opinion on on side chain other than I, I like Paul as as an individual. Uh, it, it's a little, it's a little too complicated, uh, a little bit too much above my pay grade. Um, but the the point is, like, I've been following, I've been following all those developments, and you know, 
I've been doing the Bitcoin presentations, the Bitcoin PowerPoints, uh, the Bitcoin one-on-ones with the community, uh, like a bunch of us have been doing. And a lot of the things that you will find in such PowerPoint presentations, it's, you know, whenever someone talks about scalability, they talk about Lightning Network and they talk about sidechains as, you know, the future of Bitcoin. Um, so I guess my, you know, one of the reasons I got so interested is, is okay, so I, I, I have a Bitcoin application, I have the technical know-how to integrate uh, uh, these technologies um, so how about we move from the realm of theory where lightning net network you know uh, sorry where side chains is kind of like a, a mythical creature that will solve a lot of problems and uh, let's see if we can integrate that in practice and see if it actually works if it actually claims what it says it does if there's actually market demand um, and um, I've been uh, hanging around Bitcoin conferences for a while you know I'll good terms with uh, with um, Samson and, and Adam, and uh, it became kind of obvious to, to us that, you know, tech, from a technical standpoint, there's not a lot of uh, exchanges out there that are savvy enough or curious enough to integrate those technologies. So I guess we just took it upon ourselves to integrate the liquid stack and uh, provide the market feedback that the developers and the federation is looking for. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, how, how did you really like pull off the kind of like structure that you're doing like from a regulatory point of view? Because pr pretty much what, what you're doing is like, you know, in the, the short gist is letting people buy this stable coin locked to the Canadian dollar and move the KYC there so that they can go get Bitcoin now and pull that out without that bit that specific Bitcoin UTXO being tied to their identity or purchase. And like, you know, like, how did you pull that off? Because like, that's brilliant in the way that to the letter, at least it, it fulfills all the laws, but you still get to walk away with Bitcoins that aren't tracked in perpetuity unless you actively mix them. Yeah, so let's dig into that. So, I mean, uh, just before we start, um, there's three things that we want to do with the sidechain. Um, only one of which requires being a member of the sidechain of the Liquid Federation, which was like the, the announcement we did in Riga. We announced that we were going to become a member. So the first thing is accepting and sending LBTC. The second one is performing pegouts from the sidechain on behalf of users and on behalf of ourselves. And the third one is, is issuing a Canadian dollar denominated uh, asset. So the the and and to to be a hundred percent clear, we don't yet know how this is going to be treated from a regulatory standpoint. But I'm confident enough in my own interpretation that we're just going to go ahead and do it and see and see how um, regulatory authorities uh, react and if they agree with our assessment. So the way that I see it, you know, most stable coins, most and I don't like the word stable coin because it implies that fiat currencies are stable. I use I use the word <laughs> I use the, the word fiat coin personally. So what most fiat coins are, they're actually, you know, open loop gift cards, right? I, I don't see them as as being different than any of the cash-based vouchers that you see or you know vanilla visa prepaid cards or, or, or something of that nature um, so that's where I started so okay so let's 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 start with the assumption that a fiat coin is an open loop gift card um, open loop open loop gift, gift cards are actually regulated uh, differently than regular gift cards right um, they since they are more liquid and can be liquidated for cash in most instances and they have active you know secondary markets they actually regulated it in tight in a tighter way um, so what we decided to say hey um, let's just create a closed loop gift card for Bitcoin uh, that is only redeemable at both Bitcoin so uh, what we tried to do is basically the same as a Tim Hortons gift card or for you Americans a duck and donuts gift card where we um, will issue uh, so the LCD asset is a gift card that's the way that I portray it I don't think of it as a fiat coin I think of it as a gift card and the main the main difference is uh, you can't withdraw that gift card for cash you can only use it to buy Bitcoin so kind of the background on that is um, <laughs> this is going to be a little bit long and technical regarding OTC desks but we're trying to make we try to make bull Bitcoin as as non-custodial and as trustless as possible. Obviously, um, we're a centralized OTC platform. It's never going to be non-custodial entirely. And it's never going to be trustless. Um, so the first thing we did to make it non-custodial was we don't hold users' Bitcoins. So when you're selling use Bitcoins or you're paying your bills, 
um, since we are the counterparty for every transaction, um, we don't act as a middleman between a buyer and a seller. We are the buyer and the seller in every transaction. Um, as soon as we receive the Bitcoins, they're considered sold. So they become our possession as soon as we receive them. And then we send the fiat afterwards. Same thing when you buy Bitcoin from us, um, you don't have a wallet. There's, no wa there's no Bitcoin wallet on Bull Bitcoin or there's no Bitcoin balance. You'll never see any place where it says that you have 0 0.5 Bitcoins in your account. They're sent directly out to your Bitcoin wallet. But in the case of fiat, it's different. You know, there's no atomic swaps between fiat and Bitcoin. When you're buying Bitcoin from someone, you know, someone has to send either the fiat first or the Bitcoin first. Um, and in our case, uh, people have to send the fiat first and then they trust us that once the fiat payment is cleared, we're going to send the Bitcoin out to them. So it's like we are technically custodian of the funds, of the fiat funds for a little while. Although I don't really see it as, as really being inherently different than, you know, going to a McDonald's drive through and, you know, you pay at the first window and then you drive a little bit forward and then you get your burger at the second window. You know, technically speaking, you know, you know McDonald's is custodian of your fiat up until the moment where you actually get the goods, in this case, the hamburger delivered to you. Um, so, you know, the obvious, the obvious way to fix that is, well, as soon as we receive the dollars, um, the rate is locked and then we send the Bitcoin directly to you, um, which means that uh, just like in Bitcoin, as soon as the dollar, is, dollar payment is cleared by our bank, um, we don't hold it as, you know, as soon as it's clear, then we send the Bitcoins out to you. But this opens an, an, uh, another problem, which is how does the user know when the payment was actually cleared? Unlike Bitcoin transactions, you know, if you send a wire to an exchange, and they tell you that it was clear at 5 p.m. I mean, that's not necessarily true. Maybe it was clear at 12 p.m. Maybe it was clear at 9 a.m. that same morning. And uh, since the user doesn't know, well, it's kind of up to the exchange to decide, OK, where, when do I tell the user that his payment was cleared? And this allows the OTC broker or the exchange to manipulate the time at which he tells the user his payment was received in order to give him a different exchange rate. Um, so we decided not to go for that option. So what we did is we, we started selling these vouchers on Bull Bitcoin. So instead of buying Bitcoin and Bull Bitcoin, you buy a voucher um, and then that voucher can be used to uh, purchase Bitcoins on the website. And if that voucher is not used within uh, X amount of days, we started out at 30 days, now it's 180 days. So if the voucher is not used within 180 days, we send a fiat um, uh, refund to your bank account. Uh, and this was to disincentivize people from using us as a bank or as a custodian. So that's kind of the background. And then so we realized, okay, so um, once someone has the voucher in his platform, there's only one thing he can do, two things he can do. He can buy Bitcoin for himself, or he can wait for the voucher to expire and then get his money back. He can't close his voucher if, if, uh, if the 180 days hasn't, hasn't been used. So we decided to um, uh, tokenize uh, those vouchers, which already exist on our platform, as an LCD asset. Um, and uh, this allows the user to withdraw the voucher from our platform and then whatever and do whatever he wants with it afterwards. So um, the regulations uh, regarding KYC AML apply to uh, foreign currency transactions and payment processing transactions that are over a thousand dollars a day. Um, so technically speaking, if you're if you're buying a voucher on Bull Bitcoin today, um, the KYC ML regulations don't force us to uh, uh, to KYC you, but we still KYC you uh, because of the chargeback risk, because it's so easy in Canada to defraud someone's bank account and buy Bitcoin with it. So, you know, not a lot of people know this, but um, the main so the main reason why exchanges KYC, KYC their users is to ensure that whoever is sending the fiat uh, is, uh, whoever the user is sending the fiat from a bank account is the actual owner of the bank account, because otherwise the user can just call the bank and say, hey, it wasn't me, my bank account was hacked, I didn't actually mean to send a thousand bucks to bull Bitcoin, um, uh, please revert the payment. And in this case, the bank will revert the payment. We already sent out the Bitcoin to whoever was pretending to be the user and we, uh, we also lose the fiat. Um, so uh, we're still going to KYC people to buy vouchers. But, you know, since the money is pre-funded, once the voucher is created, if it's on LCED, if it's on liquid, the user can withdraw that voucher to his green wallet, send it to anybody else. And then after that point, um, we don't have to KYC for the purchase of Bitcoin with an LCED voucher um, because the 
original person who funded the voucher has already been KYC'd and the legal KYC limits only apply starting $1,000 a day. So there's kind of like this niche uh, market where, you know, people are going to be uh, hopefully trading LCD on secondary markets platforms and peer to peer. And then, you know, um, if you want to uh, send Bitcoin to your friend and you don't want him to go through a horrible KYC experience, well, you can buy the LCD, withdraw it to green, send it to his green wallet. And then when he goes to buy Bitcoin, we're going to treat it um, exactly like a cash based voucher today, which means no KYC up until the thousand dollars. So that's the that's the general idea regarding KYC. And the, the regulatory aspect of it is just, hey, this is a gift card, a closed loop gift card. It's, this is the same as Subway issuing gift cards. In this case, it's just bull Bitcoin who is issuing a gift card redeemable at bull Bitcoin. We think this is much more transparent and communication to the user. So they don't think they're buying some kind of universal fiat coin that is uh, able to be spent at everywhere else. Uh, that's not at all what's intended. This this asset is only has only has value because someone can use it ultimately any of the day to buy Bitcoin or bull Bitcoin at today's rate at a day's rate. Yeah, so you kind of like, <clears throat> you know, like run through that real quick again. So like pretty much like the original one step process of just a bank to the OTC desk, like they have the ability to screw you on price. So you move to a voucher to alleviate that concern. But then like the issue with the voucher is now like you are locked into buying Bitcoin or pretty much stuck in like a time lock before you can get your fiat back. So you now move to this notion of tokenizing it on liquid to remove that problem. And like pretty much what I see you as having done is taken this one step process and stretch that into like a multi-step stack of processes. And in doing so, like you're, you've been able to pretty much cover a lot of these problems from the original process and that crept up in subsequent ones, but also, um, like just in general create like this separation of concerns that that allows you to kind of manage and move forward in a more reasonable way too yeah yeah absolutely there's another kind of there's another kind of niche benefit that i've been exploring um with uh, those kinds of stable coins which is the slight difference between being custodial and being a counterparty so you know from the point of view of a user if you have like a gift card balance redeemable at an exchange or you have um, a deposit of fiat on that exchange, if the exchange goes bust, um, it's the same to you, right? Uh, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, if you have a worthless gift card, it's the same as having your balance on the exchange disappear. However, there's, there's, a, different, there's a different aspect to it, which is regulatory enforcement. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm, this is a working theory that I have, and I'm, you know, this one of the reasons why we're putting this out there is to test those theories. But the theory that I have is that um, let's say that you have a voucher on bull Bitcoin today, and um, a government authority sends me, uh, you know, a subpoena, and they tell me you need to freeze this guy's funds. Well, what I'll do is I'll I'll freeze that voucher. I'll make that voucher non-redeemable. But then, it, but then afterwards, uh, the government can say, hey, you've frozen this guy's funds. We want you to transfer those funds to us as a wire transfer because we want to seize, we're going to actually take custody of those funds. And in that case, well, I, I'm the, you know, I have the, 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 the voucher balance. I, I, I can and I will move those funds. Uh, however, if the user has withdrawn um, LCAD uh, using a liquid from the platform, the same government uh, enforcement agency can come to me and say, hey, here's a subpoena. Um, you need to confiscate this guy's funds. And I can say, well, I can't confiscate his LCD uh, because he, uh, he he withdrew them from the platform. And there's no way that I can contact the Liquid Federation and, and you know, block his LCD. Um, so the only thing I can do in this case is to block this user from being able to redeem his LCD for BTC. Uh, on my platform, but I cannot stop this user from sending out the LCD to someone else. Uh, so this removes one of the burdens of being an exchange, which is to actually have to transfer fiat funds uh, to uh, regulatory agencies and enforcement agencies as bank accounts. Um, so this is one of the other side benefits that I've been kind of conceiving, although it's uh, entirely possible that the enforcement agency is not going to uh, believe, for example, that I can freeze the LBTC asset and they're going to, you know, uh, try, you know, try and do something with it. But as far as I'm concerned, you know, LB, uh, li uh, liquid assets are incredibly difficult to track. 
on the on the uh, on the on the liquid uh, sidechain. So if, even if they want me to blacklist a certain LCD asset, uh, I'm not even sure I can. So this is how uh, the AML KYC enforcement should be. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna block ish in units of money. I'm gonna block people's accounts, uh, which is a little bit different than you know what we can do today. Yeah, I mean that. That sounds like a, a very reasonable theory. And I mean, yeah, I, I know you're in Canada and not the United States, but you know how this case develops with um, crypto capital or whatever they were, the, the custodian uh, involved with Finex and all the other exchanges that had um, a large portion of the tether funds frozen. Like, I think how that case plays out very much could inform how, how your theory about how to handle this could uh, play out as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, the mentality is basically just, you know, say sorry instead of asking for permission. So hopefully this uh, and, th th you know, we're reasonably resourceful and smart about dealing with regulation. So if anybody can pull this off, uh, I, I think uh, I think it's us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, just thinking about it, it's like it's it seems like a solid argument because the minute that token's gone, it's like you even when it comes to like removing money in a, in a bank account backing that like you how do you ascertain that that's still in that person's control that that's their money that you're removing the backing from the point like you that's the government pretty much um potentially forcing you to defraud other customers who haven't done anything illegal yeah yeah absolutely and all of all of this thinking really uh was as a, as a result of uh, interacting with a lot of street level Bitcoin users. Um, street le by street level Bitcoin users, you know, a good example of that will be, you know, sexual professionals. And uh, they, they've been using prepaid cards uh, forever as liquid form of fiat dollars, right? So uh, whether that is, you know, a PaySafe card, a vanilla Visa card, or an Amazon card, a lot of these people will physically trade these uh, fiat denominated items. Um, as a bearer asset, much like they would with cash. And um, uh, nobody has so far, you know, went to uh, PaySafe and say, hey, we want you to track um, this particular gift card because it's obviously impossible to do um, since those, those exchanges uh, appear off ledger. Um, uh, I, I'm still not sure exactly how uh, private LCD is. I know that LBTC uh, is going to be fairly private. Um, the, the liquid Bitcoins transfers are, are using confidential uh, assets. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how much confidential assets brings privacy because as far as I can tell, it only hides the amounts and not the destination addresses. Um, but, but I mean, it, it's, it's... You can also mix different assets too. So like you can not only coin join not worrying about amounts, you can coin join not worrying about what other assets you're mixing with too. So you, you could get a very high degree of privacy with that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and you know, some of the other challenges that I have with this, um, there's a few risks that already exist, that, that there's a few additional risk that tokenization brings to the user. Well, the first obvious risk is like, if we send you an LCD and you lose the key, well, I'm sorry, like we're not going to cancel that LCD because uh, we can't know uh, if you lost it or not. And we can't know if someone that is redeeming it uh, might not be your friend that you sent it to. So this obviously uh, has a, you know, some kind of barrier barrier there. And the other the other uh, thing, the other additional risk is, you know, normally at Bull Bitcoin, if your voucher expires, we just refund it. Uh, to the bank account of whoever bought it, right? So when you when you buy a voucher, we know your bank account, we know where the wire came from. So if the voucher expires, we just send the money back to that bank account, whether you like it or not. However, if you withdraw it as LCD and move it around, um, the LCD doesn't have an expiry date, right? So what happens, for example, if we go out of business or we disappear, we can't even refund you if we want to, right? Because um, we don't know who you are. You need to come and, and claim it. However, um, what we realize is that you can send the LBTC address, uh, you can sell the LBTC to an LCED address. So um, although we don't know what is the bank account of the owner of an LCED address, in the case that we actually do need to close that token and send him the money because we're closing operations or something like that, um, we can just send them LCED, which we couldn't do before because we uh, our current vouchers aren't associated to Bitcoin addresses. Um, they're just associated to bank accounts. Um, so that's a neat thing that
that LCD allow you know there, there's a mitigation uh, there's some there's some mi some misgridigation that we can do with uh, with LCD regarding that. Yeah, yeah, that that's fucking awesome. <laughs> like you just lock the the price in there and just like set up the the redemption. Like yeah, I mean, you know, like this this yep. whole like you know thought process you have in like setting this up like this it is just awesome. It's like the, the way it sets up and compartmentalizes all of the, the information is like, you know, you, you can effectively as a platform become a, a privacy shield that, that lets, um, you know, lets your user base effectively trust you as their, their information silo. And then you act as a shield for other businesses they interact with. Yes, yes, exactly. And to some degree, we're already acting this way because when they send fiat payments, they're already KYC'd. Um, but there's no reason why uh, we can't provide additional privacy measures uh, with Liquid if they want to go, you know, on second markets and something like that. And, you know, other than uh, and regarding LBTC, you know, the Liquid Bitcoin, um, uh, that's that was one of the thought processes was not necessarily um, the cheap transaction and low fees. Although, uh, sorry, the, the cheap fees and fast uh, confirmation times, um, which is you know part of the reflection going long term, but it's also a privacy uh, measure. For example, um, the use case that so I'm going to talk a little bit about just ex why are we accepting LBTC and and allow people to buy Bitcoin with LBTC. Um, well, the use case that I have in mind uh, is this is definitely for traders and for um, brokers and institutions. I don't see any like retail user uh, today um, finding any need for LBTC. Uh, they can use Lightning Network for, for that. Um, but Lightning Network payments over 250, 300 bucks today, uh, 500 bucks, you know, they're, they're, it's hard to find a route. There's not enough liquidity sometimes and, you know, the payments very often fail. But one of the nice benefits of uh, LBTC is if you're a Canadian trader and you want to trade on BitMEX, for example, um, you can't send a wire transfer to BitMEX. Uh, and if, if, even if it was Bitfinex, you don't necessarily want to send an international transfer to Bitfinex's bank. If you do that, if you send an international transfer to a well-known Bitcoin exchange outside of Canada, it's very likely that your bank will freeze the transfer. And they'll say, hey, why are you transferring money to some Japanese bank or some bank in the Cayman Islands or whatever bank the Bitcoin exchange you're using is using. Um, uh, Canadian banks love uh, international internal transfer. Um, they're not big fans of international transfers. So a trader can go on bull Bitcoin and buy LBTC directly instead of buying Bitcoin. Once he has the LBTC, he can send that LBTC to the exchange. Um, and uh, there's no there's no chain analysis software that I know of right now that's going to be able to tell that this guy went from bull Bitcoin to Bitfinex because it's on the uh, it's on the the, the liquid sidechain. Um, he can do his trading on Bitfinex, you know, hopefully not lose lose all his money. And once he's done trading his LBTC, um, he might want to he might have his uh, trading float in Canadian dollars, so he wants to hedge himself, right? He doesn't want to keep the LBTC on the exchange, and he doesn't want to keep the money on the exchange as a CAD balance there um, because he doesn't trust whichever exchange is holding the funds. So then what he does is after trading on you know BitMEX, he'll go back to Bull Bitcoin, um, send uh, the LBTC to Bull Bitcoin, will cash him out in fiat. So what he will have achieved is essentially move Bitcoin from Canada using a fiat deposit to an international exchange, withdrew the Bitcoin to Canada and then in fiat without actually creating a Bitcoin transaction on the Bitcoin main chain. So whoever is looking for Bitcoin transactions on the main chain for this type of behavior will not see anything. Um, all they will be able to see on the main chain really is uh, bull Bitcoin's peg in and peg outs, um, which they presumably can tie to us, but definitely cannot tie to any individual user, uh, regardless of what behavior he had with his Bitcoin wallet on the chain before or after. So if he screwed up his privacy before or after going on bull Bitcoin, they still won't be able to know that he went on BitMEX or Bitfinex. So you like again taking that kind of privacy shield analogy to the most extreme for like traders, and it's like I, I yep. really really hope that more like Bitcoin aligned businesses in this space kind of learn from what you're doing here. And if this 
flies acceptably like doing similar things because like this is exactly what needs to be done like we need trading platforms that just say fuck the rules completely but we also need to like you know find a way to hack the the platforms that don't do that into being safer and more private for people yeah and there's much lower hanging fruits than integrating liquid for privacy just kind of a side side note here um it is absolutely unacceptable that these trading platforms still use single address deposits uh the single deposit addresses uh, there's no technical reason for it there's no legal reason for it um for example you look at bitmax they still have single uh, address deposits and not only that they have vanity address deposit addresses to make it more convenient for people to track BitMEX users on the blockchain. Um, I, I think before integrating Liquid, the first thing they can do is implement reusable uh, deposit address with BIP32. I mean, BIP32 has been out there for five years uh, in production. Um, I have I see no reason why they should be uh, using uh, be using that. And the second thing they can do is just integrate CoinJoin first before uh, before Liquid. I mean, the CoinJoin integration that we have at Bull Bitcoin works phenomenally well. Um, we don't have any issues. You know, uh, sure it adds a, it adds a few hours every day into our normal Bitcoin operations, but that's not that much of a huge deal. You can just make yourself a schedule as a company as to, you know, be prepared to wait four hours more for Bitcoins to come out of the coin join. It's no big deal. Um, but yeah, I agree. Like uh, uh, all of these trading platforms are very bad at privacy. There's quick things they can do and there's no legal reason for them to be bad at privacy. Um, I have never, ever seen a single piece of regulation which requires Bitcoin exchanges to keep track of user deposits in and out and to flag users based on the, the, the patterns of their UTXOs. I've never seen that. Um, you'll see exchanges claiming that they use analysis because they want to be regulatory compliant, but I call bullshit on that big time. I think what's actually happening is that most of the exchanges, and I mean, I know this for a fact, <laughs> I mean, and what I know is happening is that a lot of the exchanges have difficulty getting a bank account and then they were kind of fighting with banks, compliance departments, trying to figure out, figure out solutions to convince the compliance departments that they were doing everything they could to prevent money laundering. So they started to integrate analysis and go to the banks, hey, look at that, we have this really fancy cutting edge Bitcoin analysis tool um, to augment our KYC AML policy so we can be assured that the source of funds is, is okay. Um, so please give us a bank account. Uh, I think this is what happened. And then um, the bank started to ask that of the exchanges. They said, oh, well, you want an account at my bank? Where's your uh, Bitcoin chain, al chain analysis strategy? Sh show me that. And the exchanges were like, oh, well, we don't have one. And they're like, well, all the other ones, all the other exchanges have ones. Why don't you have one? You're standing out. You know, you're standing out as an exchange which doesn't have chain analysis. Why? And they'll say, uh, well, no reason. And they'll just go and take those chain analysis solutions. So um, there's, I think the only justification for exchanges not doing stuff like this is just they don't care. Yeah, this is why I refer to them as blockchain surveillance companies instead of blockchain analysis, because it's basically just an extension of the extra legal stuff that banks already do to appear compliant with rules that don't actually exist in the law, but only exist because they've been imposed on them by banks. Yeah, I mean, this is where it's like you're saying, I mean, with this new product i mean this is something that you're going to offer your customers there at bull bitcoin but like yeah i've just been really yeah i mean seeing just the counter of what we talk about is like this uh new cypher trace program recently we talked about like they're offering this to exchanges to where they could just plug it in and follow the fatf travel rule and to have some guys like you at bull bitcoin that are doing things like coin join as a best practice and you know absolutely trying to implement something to protect your users from you know data leaks and their own you know protect their privacy and i'm just curious in this uh in this lcd product and like are you going to try and do something with music and lbtc to try and you know create these bigger coin joins and do things like that or is it just the lcd and lbtc is that's going to provide the layer of privacy for them or are you guys going to be testing some other things with the uh, liquid 
I don't really know about music that much. Um, I guess when we start to actually integrate, we're probably going to figure that out. Uh, one thing I'm interested in, in leveraging from Blockstream is their atomic swap tool. So um, since there's no KYC under $1,000 a day, um, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't do an atomic swap between LCD and uh, BTC to some of our users um, if they're registered at least with an email address and a phone, which is like the minimum requirements. I'm not sure about I'm not sure about um, music. Um, if you wanna if you wanna go into it now uh, and explain it to me, that that'd be great. Otherwise, I can just read read up on it. Uh, music is pretty much the the multi sig protocol with Schnorr. Um, that lets you um, wind up with just a single signature for the multi-sig address, but it's um it, it's interactive, so you would actually have to like directly peer with the other uh, wallet participants to create the signatures. Okay, okay, I see what you mean. Um, well, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess uh, the our strategy to integrate these kind of things is we first what we do is we put the software as a component of Cipher Node and we expose all of the features of that software through the Cypher Node API. And then our web app will build some logic uh, based on the functionalities that are in the software via Cypher Node. So if, for, if you know, there's a music uh, like API, uh, if there's a music function in, in Liquid in the future, um, in order to integrate that stuff into an app, is really easy. It's not re really hard. Um, and you know, another point I want to make uh, before we finish the privacy aspect, uh, uh, or you know, just regarding privacy in general, is that um, I, I think that soon in Canada, the exchanges will have no choice but to implement CoinJoin, and at least no choice to implement address reuse. Because you know, I, I meet a lot of people at Bitcoin conferences, and whenever the topic of privacy comes up, you see that a lot of people are afraid of being non-compliant and being sanctioned by governments because they're implementing privacy practices. But the opposite is actually true. There is such a thing in Canada as the Privacy Act and the Electronics Document I don't know, Confidentiality Act or whatever. Uh, there's, I can't remember the name, but there's uh, three or four pieces of legislation in Canada that very strictly regulate what businesses can do with the information of their clients. And a very crucial component of that law, of these, of these uh, laws, is that you cannot disclose a user's information to third parties without their consent. Uh, and uh, that is a very big offense of the privacy laws. And in some instances, you need to actually shut down your operations and fix the problem before you are actually allowed to operate. Um, so by not implementing reusable addresses for each invoice and by not implementing CoinJoin, the exchanges are inadvertently leaking the user's info to third parties because through their bad management of the user's UTXO, they reveal information about the UTXO, such as how much money does the user have, right? Because you can look back in this history and cluster the addresses into a wallet and determine that he has at least X amount of Bitcoins in the wallet. Um, but just the fact that the user is using your platform itself, that fact itself is a breach of uh, the user's personal data and, tra and transactional data. Um, so um, uh, you're actually uh, breaching the law if you're not using reusable addresses and, uh, and using CoinJoin. And on top of that, uh, you are getting spied on by other exchanges. So, you know, we've seen a few announcements of exchanges that are acquiring, uh, you know, a chain, chain analytics platform, notably, you know, Coinbase and Neutrino. And I think, uh, Janine, you were, you know, one of the first people to break out that news, um, you know, along with, uh, along with myself, uh, that they were associated with, uh, uh, what's it called again, hacker group or something like that out of Milan, hacking Italy. Hacking team. Uh, hacking team. Um, and my first reaction was not instantly that they're uh, collaborating with governments. My first reaction was, these assholes want to spy on other exchanges and reverse engineer their transaction volumes. And also, they want to figure out which of their users are also users of other exchanges to see where their users are leaking to. So they can target those users with additional marketing. I think this is uh, definitely something that uh, uh, some exchanges have been doing. I mean, to be honest, which 
you know, savvy Bitcoin OTC or exchange operator hasn't once, you know, sent some dust somewhere to see to see what happens. I mean, a long, long, long time ago, I did that to a Bitcoin ATM. I sent some dust there and I was like, oh, I'll just follow and see how much volume this Bitcoin ATM is doing. I mean, it's it's quite easy to do. Uh, so when you're not implementing those practices, not only you're not compliant with your law, but you're just not being diligent as a bit uh, as a business person. You're certainly not acting in the best interests of your shareholders. Um, so I think that, you know, privacy by default in Bitcoin exchanges is just a reality that's going to happen. And it's going to happen most likely, I think, the best way to make that happen quickly is if a Bitcoiner tries to make a complaint at the Privacy Commissioner of Canada against a Bitcoin exchange and uh, see what happens. I am pretty confident that uh, given the explanation that, you know, I've just been given to you guys and to the audience, any Privacy Commissioner will see that I am correct and that these exchanges need to change their policies ASAP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mean, the uh, the act that you mentioned earlier, it's the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, or PIPEDA. That's that's the one, yes. I would be interested to have some people pour through the Banking Secrecy Act in, in the U.S. and see if similar conclusions can be arrived at. Definitely, uh, it applies for sure to banks. Uh, in Canada, there's a there's a more generic version of this for all businesses and there's a more specific one to banks but uh, canadian uh, exchanges are regulated as money service businesses so they're not regulated according to banking laws but um i wouldn't be surprised that some of the bit licensed companies uh have such bank-like uh, additional privacy protection measures for their users which would make their breach of those regulations even more severe Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is one of those things where we talk about, you know, what's it like to build on Bitcoin? It's a lot of like just getting out there and figuring out like how you can put this thing together to where people understand what you're doing on a technological level that to where you're not really breaking any laws. You're just making this, you know, clear product for the customer to understand, to protect their value and their and their privacy and all that, where it is really bad nowadays, where a lot of people just hand over all those liberties and those rights in those terms of service and it is like in the big tech companies like they feel beholden to certain intelligence agencies to you know enact those terms of services and just sort of write the language it is and and then uh, yeah, they capitulate zero. from the beginning they, they've already capitulated before they've begun and i think one of the reasons this is why is that in the fin in the fintech startup community you know there's a saying which is like in regular tech if you screw up you know you start again and in fintech if you screw up you go to jail um so i i mean i think that perhaps they're just not as convicted uh and committed to bitcoin as other people uh and they don't want to risk their own necks so they're being extra careful they're more interested in the business the startup aspect than you know creating tools for the bitcoin revolution so given the fact that you know the the punishment for uh, breaking the U.S. Uh, banking and financial overlords uh, dictates is pretty severe. I don't blame them, but yeah, they you know ultimately uh, they, you can get away with a lot of stuff because a lot of what we're doing is actually not is actually not a financial service. It's technology. You know, speaking of that, you know, one of the things that we're going to do with Liquid is the peg out. So the way that Liquid works is that there is a whitelisted list of peg out keys public keys that are given to members of the federation so when you become a member of the liquid federation you know you sign a contract right you sign an agreement and then there's some paperwork uh you know i'm about to do that now uh the paperwork stuff and then uh so uh, i'll check i haven't yet read yet uh read the terms of con and conditions which is something i'm very interested in um but uh you become you 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 have this ability to create a Bitcoin transaction out of the multi-sig federation, which is automatically signed by the federation members because it respects the liquid uh, consensus rules. So in order to be sensitive... Uh-oh, stop. I think you accidentally muted there, Francis. Oh, am uh -oh. I back? Yeah, yeah, you're back. Okay. Oh, sorry. It's the, the push to talk. So when, uh, where was I? Uh, Liquid what? Federation automatically signing uh, yeah. whitelisted addresses to withdraw. Yeah, exactly. So this is how you peg out of Liquid. You, you uh, create a request to uh, peg out. And if you are signing this request with a whitelisted peg out key, then it's fulfilled. 
Um, so this is why uh, Liquid is not trustless, because there is a, a centralized governance system uh, to allow certain people to have unrestricted pegouts. Uh, so the idea with us is that I do not consider that a Liquid pegout is a financial transaction or payment processing transaction. Uh, I see it as a technological service uh, where I'm re relaying uh, messages back and forth um, uh, uh, the sidechain and, and the user's uh, uh, main chain, the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, and acting as a kind of uh, technological bridge between these two, uh, these two ledgers. Uh, so as long as I'm not pegging out the user uh, with my own funds, uh, which I wouldn't be doing. What I would be doing, I would say, hey, uh, the user wants a peg out to this Bitcoin address. Uh, I uh, send the peg out request to the, the side chain and they're pegging out to this guy. So it's not my money. Uh, and uh, I'm not performing a financial transaction. I'm not custodian at any time of those funds. I'm just relaying messages. Um, so my idea is to, again, uh, like try and see if uh, we can't have uh, these anonymous pegouts with no no limits, no KYC essentially. Uh, so acting as a as a pegout entity, you know, uh, maybe even an, uh, outside of the regular service of bull Bitcoin, and allow users to peg out. So that's that's kind of the plan. That's one of the things that we want to explore to see if that's something that's possible. Um, because if it's very difficult to peg out from LBTC, that's a problem. Right. There needs to be multiple exit points. They need to be redundant across different jurisdictions uh, with different regulatory regimes so that the peg out itself of LBTC cannot be censored, which currently there is like, I think, Bitfinex that offers it and may, uh, and then Italian exchange called uh, the Rock Trading, I think, mm -hmm. offers the peg out. Uh, but no one else, I think, really offers pegouts currently. Uh, so that's that's one of the things that, you know, speaking of this kind of approach to regulation where we're like, hey, uh, the burden of proof is on you to tell me that what I'm doing is not correct, not on me, because my logic is perfectly sound. My interpretation of the regulation is perfectly sound. So if you want to stop from doing that, then, you know, I'm going to start doing it and then you're going to force me to stop doing it. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the approach. And uh, if you have that approach, well, well, you can, uh, I mean, it's important what we're doing now because regulation is a ratchet, right? So once you regulate, you never deregulate. That never happens. It's kind of like a, like a gear, you know, it only moves in one direction. So if, you know, we're very uh, capitulating on the regulations now and all these things now, well, we're screwed forever. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's, that's the general approach with, with liquid. That's the three main things. So accept and accept and send LBTC, the uh, the Liquid CD gift card, uh, LCD asset thing, and the the pickout. That's awesome to hear, man. Just like yeah, we need more people building these pegouts and more people coming into the Liquid Network to build out these systems. Because yeah, I mean, it just is going to take people coming together to actually build the things and then test the regulations as much as possible and. Yeah, I'm real hopeful about where I'm at here in Colorado. Hopefully one day we can build something out similar and, you know, also participate in this process and really test these things out and, you know, really improve people's ability to, you know, maintain their value and their privacy moving forward without uh, all of the current levels of surveillance that goes on. Yeah, and, and I'm, you know, for all the bad things about Canada and Canada being, you know, the socialist country that it is, um, in terms of legal enforcement and that kind of stuff and, uh, uh, y you know, and kind of aggressiveness of the government, we're pretty blessed to have a, a rather level-headed and, and chilled, you know, bureaucratic apparatus. Um, so, yeah, yeah uh, people that are in such jurisdictions uh, should take advantage of that to the fullest and experiment because, uh, you know, you folks in the U.S., uh, unfortunately, you know, it's not the land of the free regarding uh, <laughs> financial services and, and cryptography specifically. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty chill to be to be up here. Yeah, man, you're going to have to come through Colorado again. I know I've seen you skiing out here once. You're going to have to stop through Boulder. It's a real unique place where, yeah, there's like similar. It's a neat little governance apparatus where the people can still sort of influence. And the legislation we have seen passed recently, we've got a governor elected who is he, you know, ran a little bit on he wants to enable blockchain technologies and, you know, using the blockchain buzzwords and stuff. But he I mean, he came from technology background and the idea of building out something like this and doing something like y'all are doing there 
in Canada would be great to build build out here, and I'm hopeful we could do that one day. Oh, totally! Fuck, I love Colorado. Shout out to Colorado. I was just uh, camping there in the in the mountains two weeks ago. I'm definitely Woo! gonna go back. Uh, yeah, back to skiing there. And yeah, I mean, there's there's for sure gonna be those pockets of uh, of regulatory arbitrage possible. You know, um, this has been theorized by the cypherpunks since the beginning. It was the plan since the beginning. I've just finished reading, you know, the cypherpunk bible, the Cryptonomicon, and obviously. Uh, it includes a, a, a fictional country which acts as a regulator, regulatory arbitrage play for people who want to do digital currencies and, uh, and uh, anonymous internet and so forth. So, you know, Canada's probably not going to be that place because it tends to, over, t over time, follow whatever the U.S. tells it. And if Bitcoin becomes an issue, it's you know, likely that they're going to follow the U.S., but there's going to be pockets somewhere uh, around the world where people are going to be setting up those, you know, coin joint servers or these uh, peg out services or whatever, because these are business models that only can only exist on Bitcoin blockchain, right? So, you know, you look at the coin join mixing server, a zero link server. That's the most fantastic and mind blowing business model I've ever seen in my entire life. You just run a server online, make sure it has enough liquidity, and then you just get paid in Bitcoin. I mean, there's no even need for an incorporated company to operate those kinds of businesses. So that's what's cool with Bitcoin is that eventually, you know, as long as the government doesn't get you in meat space uh, and, uh, and the, the local government uh, is lax with uh, those regulations, you'll be able to operate an international business because you don't need a bank account for that. You know, all you need is a place to run your servers out of. I mean, don't be so sure the U.S. is going to continue being a behemoth uh, nightmare. Uh, you know, our state of Missouri recently just passed a law um, making all federal gun restrictions illegal and making it a crime for federal agents to come into the state and attempt to enforce those restrictions. So, uh, right. Yeah. You know, things, yeah, yeah. Things, no, things I, 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 a little, I, a little fuck you to the federal. Yeah, government. yeah. Well, I, I, I totally hope it goes that direction that the states start to because everybody in the U.S. seems to be uh, divided and angry at what the federal government should do. And, you know, the solution to that is just decentralize the power to all the states. So if you're angry, you can just fuck right off and go to another state. Uh, that's the problem in the U.S. I think there's like no mobility and, you know, democracy doesn't scale very well. Right. Sure. So, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, smaller, smaller scale democracies like this is why Swi Switzerland is doing so well. It's because the majority of the decision making is done on a, on a local level. So hopefully that's what the U.S. Uh, does. And uh, if, if that's what it does, well, I mean, Colorado is in <laughs> Wyoming and are, are basically heavens for a skier. So maybe I'll end up down there after all. Oh, yeah, man. That's one of the reasons why I came up here from the Gulf Coast area. It's just like, man, this looks like, I mean, they're the ones who legalized uh, cannabis first. And yeah, Wyoming seems to be taking the lead as far as trying to create some banking re uh, regulations to make it a real favorable environment. And there's a lot of tech companies and engineers here in Colorado and up uh, you know, come here to Boulder, there's a really unique uh, system of just people that have liquidity sitting around that could be used to test some of these things. And uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting move forward. It's definitely going to be some pockets there where we're going to build out some of that cryptonomicon. <laughs> That's also where um, Gulf's Gulch is located in Adler Shrugged. So prophetic. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Um, do you guys have uh, any uh, any questions on the liquid stuff? Uh, I think because uh, I've been kind of ranting off a little bit uh, for a while when I was talking about liquid. The only two questions I think I kind of left out was I was going to ask you what does the acronym LCD stand for, and uh, do you guys just using the Green Wallet implementation for the LCD right now? Yeah, so uh, I think the LCD was a typo that the journalist made. It's actually LCAD. Uh, which is liquid Canadian dollar. Uh, that's what it stands for. And uh, what's the second question again? Sorry. Was uh, the, that just going to be used with the green wallet? Uh, yeah. So unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of that. That's kind of like the main issue with uh, liquid is that there's only one wallet, which is liquid compatible, which is the green the green wallet. Uh, so our use our the end user 
is going to be using uh, presumably the green wallet until another wallet that supports liquid uh, uh, appears. Uh, on our side, we're not going to be using any of the green wallet stack. Um, we're building our own um, uh, liquid wallet and interface in Cypher nodes. Uh, so, well, and that's going to be avail available to everyone. Although CypherNode is not like an end user thing, uh, it's usable mainly by businesses via API. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to be developing our own wallet system, uh, which is going to be uh, offered in CypherNode alongside Bitcoin Core and Lightning. Oh, yeah. That sounds awesome, man. Like, yeah, really, yeah, that's really awesome to see what all you guys are doing with Bull Bitcoin and CypherNode and really building out everything with LBTC and yeah, just. It's awesome work you guys are doing. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of different cool stuff. Yeah, and I can also give you guys a little uh, promo on what's coming up in CypherNode. So since I met Nopara in March at uh, the Malta Understanding Bitcoin Conference, it's been kind of like our prime directive to get uh, Wasabi Wallet in CypherNode. And uh, we've are, we're nearing uh, the completion of that. It was... A lot of hard work. So um, we had to collaborate with Wasabi on creating an RPC server for Wasabi Daemon. And then we had to find a way to make that run on all the platforms we're using, like Arch, Arm, and all of that. And then um, we had to figure out a way to basically manage uh, a Wasabi stack, like a coin join stack that can be used for businesses. So what that means is that you can't like leave your coins in coin join forever. That's not, you know, the business it needs to, the coin joins need to, you know, be quick and it comes in, it comes out and it's spent out. So we need to manage also the post mix. So we created this thing that, you know, I call it the Wasabi Palace because it's kind of like a place where all of your Wasabi wallets live, and it creates multiple Wasabi wallets. And when you're querying for a receiving address, like if you're running a payment processor, you need to generate new Bitcoin addresses on the fly for new invoices. Um, it's gonna, uh, it generates uh, an address from a random Wasabi instance that you have. Uh, so then what, I, what ends up happening is that you have a bunch of Wasabi wallets that are you know, receiving coin joins and uh, randomly between them and they're, they're mixing them. And as soon as they are mixed, uh, there's like a automatic like uh, watching system that looks at the, the anonymity set. So as soon as one of the UTXOs has the desired anonymity set, it spends them out to a new uh, a wallet that's not Wasabi and a different address every time. Um, so this is gonna allow like any startup that wanted to integrate Wasabi, we realized that technically it's kind of difficult. Uh, so we built this automated tool. Uh, from the point of view of the business, it makes no difference whether you're like receiving using Bitcoin Core right now, you know, getting a new address each time and spending from Bitcoin Core. There's no difference, like in, in the integration. Uh, all you're gonna see in your daily life is, you know, you generate a Bitcoin address. And it eventually ends up being spendable, but maybe it takes a few hours before it becomes spendable in your sending wallet, and that's it. So uh, uh, the idea is like, so the other companies that are not implementing CoinJoin, they don't really have an excuse moving forward because we made it super easy. That Hell is, yeah, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Like put, put in your fucking time where your mouth is, man. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and, and if you're a developer and you want to check it out, you can go on the CypherNode uh, uh, repo. And there's a branch uh, for Wasabi that's there. So the, the development is, is in that branch. So you can see all the features there and how, how it works under the hood. I'm real sorry that Nopar couldn't be here with us today because, yeah, that's just awesome to see you guys building that stuff out and really implementing those coin joins as much as possible and getting behind that. It's just uh, been awesome to see. And, yeah, yeah, great, yeah great development work. Yeah, and, and Nopara and Lucas from uh, Wasabi have been extremely helpful and uh, responsive. So they, you know, if, if we had issues with the software, we just told them and uh, they add features or they would remove certain stuff there. Um, so that's really cool because like, you know, uh, the collaboration has been uh, really excellent and mutually beneficial. So that's uh, pretty, uh, pretty encouraging uh, to see the ecosystem like work so well like that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's pretty fucking awesome, man. And, you know, I, I think I'm pretty much plumbed out as far as, like, questions or anything uh, to dive into. I mean, uh, Rick, do you need? 
Nothing really other than just to say, yeah, I really appreciate everything you guys are doing over there and just, uh, yeah, keep it up and hopefully one day we can, you know, coordinate between uh, Boulder and Montreal. Sounds good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I guess, you know, I hope uh, everybody, you know, learned something from this and found this enjoyable. And I guess we will see you the next episode. Adios, everybody. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. Later, everyone. Hello, <laughs> <laughs>